Hi, this is Sonia Bhartia and welcome to another episode of TFR Insights. If you look at today's cloud native world, observability and monitoring is critical to the health of your workloads running in the cloud. It also critical to the health of application running the data center as well. Uh, luckily, fortunately, there are so many solutions uh, in the cloud native space for DevOps, but it still remains a big challenge. It, it is a big challenge, especially when you talk about microservices. Then we talk also about functional service where everything just goes away after a time. So today we have with us co-founder and CEO of Chronosphere, Martin Mao, uh, who used to work at Uber, where you led uh, a team of developers and SRE teams that created MT, which is an open source distributed metrics platform. And it's also you know, kind of one of the largest being used, you know, where you can scale to largest production metric. Yep. So first of all, Mao, uh, it, it's, it's a pleasure to have you on the show. I want to understand the story of Chronosphere, the name itself, and uh, why and when you decided to create the company? Yeah, it's a, it's a great question. So I don't know if there's much of a, a story behind the name. We're sort of going through various uh, name combinations. And, you know, we thought with Chronosphere, it has that sort of um, tie in with, with the concept of time. And what we are providing underneath the covers is sort of a time series database and time series technology to store all the monitoring and metrics data. Um, so that's where the, the origin of Chronosphere, the name came from. Uh, and from the company, uh, we founded it about a year ago, um, and we decided to to um, found the company because we had noticed that a lot of uh, organizations out in the world were running into the same type of challenges we ran into at Uber. Um, and having already open sourced uh, M3, as you mentioned, to solve this problem, we thought it would be a great time to actually uh, build a product on top of M3 and, and give something to other organizations outside of Uber facing similar challenges. Perfect. If you look at today's cloud native world, uh, what role do you see uh, is for monitoring and observability uh, for the health of microservices and whatever workload you are doing? What is the criticality of, of monitoring and, and observability? Yeah, it's a, it's a great question. So I think when you think about microservices in particular, and we ran into this at Uber because Uber was a very early adopter of microservice-oriented architecture. Um, from a monitoring perspective, it actually gives a, a few unique challenges. So first of all, with microservices oriented architecture, um, you no longer have a single microservice or a single application or a single monolith serving your product or your service. Uh, your product or service is actually being served by a combination of many microservices. So if you look at it from a monitoring perspective, looking at an individual application or individual monolith no longer works anymore, right? And if you look at an individual microservice, it doesn't really tell you what's going on. It doesn't give you enough information uh, because it's just one piece of many microservices that are used in combination with each other to serve a particular product or service. Um, so the, the first thing that we find is that what you really need to do is not monitor individual microservices, but you need a centralized monitoring tool that can monitor all of your microservices so you can sort of look across them uh, at that layer. Uh, the same thing sort of applies in the infrastructure layer below that as well. So at the infrastructure with cloud native, we have containers now instead of VMs. Same concept applies there. You know, if you have an individual container, looking at that in isolation doesn't really tell you that much these days. You really need to know which microservices is running on top of it and which products or services those microservices are, are fulfilling, right? So you need even all of the infrastructure monitoring to be in the same centralized place as all of your microservices. And you need that to be in the same centralized place as all of the products and services that you're providing on top of that as well. Right. Also, uh, you, you made some very interesting points there. I'm just thinking that if you look at the traditional workloads, you know, there was an importance of, you know, the same monitoring. You need to keep an eye on what is going on with your application, with the workloads. What is unique about microservices? What makes things even more challenging, more difficult? to sit outside and still be able to see what's going inside the system. Yeah, so um, I, I think one of the things that makes it more challenging is that, you know, as you mentioned, these workloads aren't consistent anymore, right? You have microservices running on infrastructure that's ephemeral. Um, you talked about functions earlier. So you have uh, much sh shorter running processes, things that are changing all the time. So it's even more critical not just to view everything in a central place, but to sort of view those things in real time uh, and, and really dive into, you know, the, the sort of um, the, the root cause of fundamental issues in real time sort of as well. I also want to learn about uh, the M3 project, you know, and the, the team that you led there. 
and uh, it's open source project was there. Uh, what does the project look like now? What kind of community is around it? Who is using it? Yeah, it's a great question. So um, as you mentioned, myself, my co-founder, Rob Skillington, uh, and the team that we led at Uber um, built and open sourced the, the M3 project, which was used internally at Uber to monitor all of our microservices, um, all of our sort of uh, cloud native infrastructure um, and all the products that sat on top of that um, as well. Um, we, we open sourced it. We actually built an open source from day one in 2016 and over time have really built up a community around the project. Um, it's been used by many sort of large enterprises and large technology companies um, around the world uh, in production today, which is great. Uh, the community has grown over time as well. We have many uh, contributors from very many different companies. Uh, Chronosphere um, still is one of the main core contributors to the project, uh, along with Uber itself, where the project originated. Uh, but we are starting to build that community outside of these two companies as well. Now let's change our gears and go back uh, to Chronosphere. Uh, we were talking about, you know, the unique challenges that microservices, you know, pose uh, when it comes to observability and monitoring. Can you talk about, you know, from the core technical point of view, what does a system look like internally? And, you know, how does it use, you know, all those existing technologies so that you can get uh, the metrics that you want from the system? Uh, so you can use it the way you want to use it. Yeah, that's, that's a great question. So uh, if you look at um, how we evolved M3 over time, we actually did many iterations of it. And some of the first iterations used open source technologies like Cassandra and Elasticsearch as our data store uh, and as our metric index. Uh, over time, what we found was that these technologies were not purpose-built for the monitoring use case and not purpose-built for the time series use case. So we actually, over time, pushed both of these technologies to their limits. Uh, and that's when we sort of looked around for sort of more um, or uh, more purpose-built technologies, both in the open source landscape and in the commercial um, in the commercial side as well. And when we couldn't find anything, that's when we sort of decided to build everything from scratch, like a lot of other big tech companies out there, you know, like uh, Google or Facebook. Facebook or Netflix, we really built everything from the ground up completely from scratch uh, so that we had a purpose built system uh, to solve this particular problem. And if you look inside M3, there's three main components. Uh, the core storage tier is a time series uh, database called M3DB uh, that we wrote uh, completely um, from scratch in Go. Uh, there's also an ingestion tier and an aggregation tier that sort of um, helps provide reliable ingestion and um, a reliable delivery uh, of all the metrics as, along with uh, features such as downsampling and aggregation. And then the third component is a query engine that allows you to query all of the data that is now stored in this time series uh, a, a database. There's three main components, all custom built and purpose built um, for the metrics and monitoring use case. Now, uh, you mentioned these three components. Uh, users, companies, organizations, they do tend to mix a lot of technologies, a lot of solutions. They may have some of their op open source projects and they want to leverage all these components. So how do you help them, uh, you know, being able to bring their own tools, you know, or leverage other tools while offering them a tight integration into their system? Yeah, it's a great question. So what, one of the main ways we do this is we make the system compatible with all of the open source standards and query languages today, right? So if you look at M3, it's actually compatible with the Prometheus clients, the Prometheus metric exposition format, and also the Prometheus query language as well. So that allows them to bring in the system and sort of replace um, the back end of, of their metrics platform with something like M3 uh, without having to change any of the way they sort of um, set up um, uh, the client side monitoring in their applications or without changing the ways they are interacting with the system when they're querying the data. So all of that remains the same, yet you're sort of switching out the back end to something that's a lot more powerful, a lot more scalable, um, and a lot more cost efficient uh, as well. Also, is is uh, is this project only for companies that are as you know that operate at the scale of Uber, or it's also for you know companies who are not that you know not running their operations at that scale? Yeah, that's a great question. So actually, what we found is that you don't have to be at Uber scale to require a technology like this, right? And this is one of the things about microservices based applications is that. Um, not only is there an explosion in data because you're moving from, you know, a few uh, monoliths to many microservices and you're moving from VMs to uh, containers, that is definitely um, helping generate more mo monitoring data than ever before. But really, um, what you want to do is uh, slice and dice your monitoring data now so that you can triage issues in real time. 
So if, if I can give you an example for that, um, if you think about a single latency metric for a microservice, you can use that latency metric to detect you know, when a particular microservice is giving slow responses, and that's great. But when that happens and when you get notified of that, you instantly want to slice and dice your data to see, to see if you can sort of figure out um, what the impact is to help you triage and figure out um, what the underlying root causes are. And to do that, you really have to add additional dimensions on this data so you can slice and dice it in different ways. So some of this could include, you know, which version of the microservice you're running because we're, we're iterating so fast and we're deploying multiple versions of these microservices over time. Um, some of that comes from the user, the end user, and the product and the service itself. So you can imagine if it's a web application, you're taking properties like which um, web browser are they using, which version of which web browser are they using, which locale are they in, to see whether you know, the issue is impacting all of your users or just a subset of your users. Uh, from the underlying infrastructure tier, you want to know where that microservice is running. Is it running in your staging environment? Is it running in your development environment? Is it running in production? Is it running in Canary? Um, you, you, want, you, you sort of want to know which parts of your infrastructure are being affected. And also other things like which availability zone this particular microservice is running on. So you can find out whether this is impacting all of your availability zones in all your regions or just a particular one to tell you whether this is maybe more of an infrastructure issue. So to be able to sort of slice and dice in real time and figure out um, what is going on to help you triage this, um, what ends up happening is you have to add more dimensions to this data. So that single latency metric, um, if you add, let's say, five dimensions onto it, and each of these five dimensions, like the ones I mentioned, has just 10 unique values, that single latency metric turns into 100,000 unique time series. And that's what you have to store, right? So when we talk about data explosion, high cardinality, uh, a lot of people instantly think about UUIDs or timestamps or something with really high cardinality, but that's not actually the case. If you have very few dimensions or tags on these pieces of data with very few values, it quickly multiplies against itself and, and, and results in a, a, a lot of data, right? And that was for a single metric in a single microservice. So you can imagine if you had, you know, 10 metrics on 10 microservices, that quickly becomes 10 tens of millions of metric time series that have been produced. So we're seeing this sort of data explosion and data cardinality problem, even at the smaller scales, not at Uber scale where we had 4,000 microservices and tens of, of billions of time series, but we're seeing it at a much smaller scale as well. And the benefit is that, you know, with, with M3, even though we cranked out a lot of the performance efficiencies, the, the scale efficiencies, the cost efficiencies, as we had to grow that to the very large um, and, 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 and very large scale, you still, uh, even at a very small scale, you get to take benefit of all of those sort of performance optimizations and cost efficiencies uh, that we put into the system. So you get to take advantage of those at a much smaller scale as well, which is great. And you know that the system that you're going to be using can sort of scale over time um, um, to the largest of such systems uh, in the world. Awesome. Now, as your users are collecting all these metrics and data, are you also collecting some <laughs> data on what problems, what challenges users face and, you know, and learn from them and bring it back to at Chronosphere and kind of, you know, keep iterating the product and project itself? For sure, for sure. We definitely do that. And this is, I think, one of the advantages of having it in open source as well, is that we can actually see very many different use cases for this technology. Whereas when we were inside Uber, we only really had one particular use case. We're only solving it for one particular company. Now that it's a community project, we're actually seeing a lot of different use cases and different um, edge cases that people are running into. And we're making sure that's being built back into both the open source project uh, and into our product as well. So with our product, with Chronosphere, we definitely start off with M3 and that's the core system um, that we that we developed. So all of our customers can leverage um, the same sort of a powerful centralized monitoring solution that we created inside Uber. But you get the team um, that ran it and built it at Uber to run it and build uh, and, and, and uh, manage it for, for our customers, uh, which is great. But we built a few things on top, and this is from learnings from the community and learnings from our customers, is, you know, um, on top of this tier, the first tier we sort of add on top of that is a... a management and control tier so that each user and each team within an organization can use this powerful central resource in a fair way, right? So you don't want to have a situation where one individual user or one individual team goes and abuses the system and sort of uses all of the resources and starves any of the other teams. So there are controls in place there such that you can cost account back to a particular user or team and you can rate limit and do things like that. So there's a, a, a management tier that we built on top from the feedback that we saw from the community and also from our, our customers. And then on top of that, um, we sort of added a, a visualization tier um, and, you know, dashboards and alerts are very sort of table stakes for any monitoring solution. So we provide those um, for sure. 
But also what we noticed is that the amount of data is actually growing um, in an exponential way much faster than the amount of users we're adding in, uh, to do the system or the amount of users l leveraging the data. So there was a huge concentration not just to provide dashboards and alerts, um, but to sort of automate the generation of these things such that the end users of these, the, these products can get an out-of-the-box experience st straight away. So you can start sort of ingesting your metrics and instantly you get your dashboards and alerts set up for you automatically. So those are some of the things that we learned uh, over time that we've added uh, to what we open sourced with M3 originally. Awesome. Thank you, Mao, for, for not only explaining observability, but also what Chronosphere is doing and also the community that you guys are helping grow and build. Uh, uh, thanks for your time today, and I look forward to talking to you again. Thank you. Thank All you. Right. You too. Thank you. Bye-bye.